Did you know that Abraham was saved by faith? I mean, before Yeshua came, before Jesus actually came to set foot on this earth to die for us, Abraham in the way beginning was saved by faith in God, not by his works, kind of just like Paul said, even in our New Testament. And did you know that many of the pharisaical thoughts that came later of, of how we are to be saved by works, the very things that many that Paul talks against, has actually not ever been God's word or his teaching. Today, we're going to continue the series in Romans that we started last week. And we're going to be going through Romans 4 to 6. And, and to, to understand what Paul is really trying to teach us in relation to the law of God, faith, circumcision, works, etc. What, how do all these things play together and what is the true gospel message that, that we can deduct from this? Last week we talked about how Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees and he himself said that. He, he proclaimed himself and identified as one. And today we're going to then look at also like what, what are the different kinds of Pharisees that existed in the day of Yeshua. Because I don't know if you know, but there were actually different factions, different kinds of Pharisees. And this very much explains why Yeshua treated one Pharisee different than another in different parts of Scripture. And if we start to understand many of these cultural aspects of what was going on in the day, we can much better understand what Paul is really trying to teach us in relation to Messiah. And today, again, Christina is going to be joining me and uh, we're going to be going through the Romans verse by verse. And we're also going to be diversing into an Acts 15. To, to the story of the Jerusalem Council, to explore this letter to the Gentiles that was given um, by, the, by the apostles and what he, they really tried to teach in relation to the bigger picture. Christina, do you want to introduce yourself to everyone? Hey everyone, my name is Christina. As Petey mentioned, we're going to be exploring this uh, chapter 4 of the Book of Romans, but also exploring the different groups of uh, Pharisees that Yeshua addressed, and even the thoughts that came from these schools of thought in the different um, groups of Pharisees that Paul is also addressing, and that will shed light on what he is saying and why he is saying what he is saying. Right, exactly. And I think we're going to just pick up where we left off last week with Abraham being saved by by in faith and not not by his own works just like we like i said we we hear paul teach so in romans 4 verse 3 we we read this again it says for what does the scripture say abraham believed god and it was reckoned to him for righteousness now this demands an, a, a question, a big question is, is how could Abraham have been saved by faith in God if Yeshua hadn't come yet? You, you know, we are, we say today, often you'll hear us say how we were saved by faith in what Jesus came to do for us. But now in the time of Abraham, Jesus hadn't come yet. So how was he saved? You see, it's actually pretty simple. Abraham was saved by his faith in the promise of God, the promise that God will bring forth what he had promised, that promise of, 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 of generations and generations of seed that from Abraham and Sarah, whose, whose womb was closed because of her old age. And so when he, he believed this promise, that was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, he believed God. And of course, Jesus was not around yet. So he couldn't have believed in, in Jesus as he was there. But he believed in the promises of God. And that part of those promises was, of course, Yeshua and what he would come to do. And so, but the, the story is different today. You know, Yeshua came and he, he walked the earth and he said that if you deny me, you deny my father. And similarly, if we deny God, we deny Yeshua. They're, because they are one. They're one. So you cannot today go if, if I, you can't today go and deny Yeshua, but then cling to God and say, "Oh, I believe in God," because you do not believe God if you do not believe in God who came in the flesh. You see, because they are one. And so we see that this whole concept of being saved through faith was there 
from the very beginning, from the from God's first encounter with man. It's always been about belief in God. And then, of course, like we discussed last week, we have this idea of of uh, then we need obedience, of course, that needs to be that that is the evidence of our belief because you can't say that I believe, but they not have the works, the good works, the good fruit that proves that belief. All right. So then uh, in Romans four verse four, we we read, and to him who is working, the reward is not reckoned as a favor, but as a debt. And to him who is not working, but believes on him who is declaring right the wicked, his belief is reckoned for righteousness. Now, it's interesting. He says that to him is working. The reward is not reckoned as favor, but as a debt. Now, what is, we need to ask the question first. What is this reward that he is speaking about? The reward, of course, is salvation. The reward is the is being saved and being able to come into the kingdom of God. That reward that Yeshua gave the thief on the cross, who, who said, oh, think of me when you enter the reigns of the kingdom. And, and in that moment, Yeshua told him, you will see, you will join me. And, he, and it's because of his belief, his belief that he believed that this man hanging on the cross next to him was the Messiah who came to die for his sins. And so that reward, he, in Romans 4, he says, to him who is working for his salvation, for the reward, it's not reckoned as a favor, but as a debt. Now, because, so basically saying, because you are working for this reward, this reward is now actually a debt. You are now in debt to receive it because you have sin, because you can, you, you, your works or kind of you're, you're dependent on your works. And because you're not depending on the favor of God that is comes from belief in Him and belief in what He has done for you, now you are rather depending on your works. And those works now actually put you in debt to that salvation you are trying to achieve. While if you are in simply trusting God in favor, then that is, we we receive it simply because he he has given it to us. We don't need to work for it. And then in the next verse, he says, to him who is not working for this reward, this salvation, but believes on him who is declaring right the wicked, his belief is reckoned for righteousness. His belief reckons him and makes him righteous. Okay. So, in Romans 4, verse 6, we, we read on and he says, Even as David also says of the blessedness of the man to him, re God reckons righteousness without works. He says this, Blessed are those whose lawlessness are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh shall by no means reckon sin. And so he's saying, hey, he's not saying blessed are those who, who don't sin. We, I mean, of course, that man would be blessed, but he's rather saying blessed is the one whose lawlessness is forgiven because he recognizes that he cannot be a good enough man to be um, sinless and be declared right simply by his works. He understands, even David in the, in the Old Testament understands that he cannot be declared right by his works. He needs to be forgiven, and that's what's going to be the blessing. Even though we have this grace, we have this favor, we see that God is still just. He's a just judge. In other words, you God cannot be loving and pure and holy and righteous and all these amazing things without being just. And with this justice that, justice that he has to be, he must administer consequences to injustice. In other words, if there is sin, there must be a, a, a you must appear before a judge for your sin, for your lawlessness. And then you need to be, the consequence needs to be administered to you for the wrong that you have done. That is what would make God a, a just judge. We see in Hebrews 9 verse 22 that he says, and according to the Torah, Almost all is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without atonement, if you will, without right ruling, 
there is no forgiveness. Without the administration of that, there is no forgiveness. And so, of course, that's a picture of what Yeshua would also come to do later, where Yeshua would then come to die for us. He is that atonement. Everything in the Torah, the sacrificial system, the, the, the shedding of blood, etc., it's all been there to simply point us to Yeshua, to point us to what He will come to do for us, that atonement of Him. And, and, and so that's what, that's what this is, that's the bigger, that's the gospel message that we all know. But Paul digs very deeper to explain the following. In Romans 4 verse 9, he says, Is this blessing then? This blessing upon the circumcised only or also upon the uncircumcised. For we affirm belief was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So he's saying, is this now just for the circumcised or for the uncircumcised too? How then was it reckoned? Being in, being in, being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the belief while in uncircumcision, for him to be a father of all who, those believing through circum, uncircumcision, for righteousness to be reckoned to them also. And in, Roman, in verse 12, and the father of circumcision to those who not only of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the belief which our father Abraham had in uncircumcision. Right, so he's saying that Abraham received this sign, and, and that word for sign is in, in, the, in the Greek, it's actually semenion, and it means it's miracle. So he says Abraham received the miracle of circumcision. And when he talks about that circumcision, he's talking about the circumcision of the heart because that's the one he received first. And he says that was a seal of the righteousness of the belief while he was in uncircumcision. So everything happened while he was physically in his flesh, uncircumcised. And so circumcision, Paul is simply using circumcision here to explain to us the idea that we circumcision is simply a a, a, um, a a picture, if you will, that it is not we are not justified in our flesh, and it's not our flesh and what we do in our flesh that that makes us right before God, or that it is what happens inside, and then what happens inside transforms us through to the outside and then the outside will start following so we have the circumcision in the heart we're struck in our heart we're convicted and we change and then outside we start applying that change that that circumcision outside as well cool and then so it's interesting because he, he says that He's the father of circumcision to not only those of the circumcision. In other words, not only to those who who were who identified as the circumcision, those who who had the law of God. And I think we're about to start just explaining to you guys. We I want to explain to you guys what what is Paul really talking about when he talks about the circumcision, because we have these different kinds of parties. Um, going around, as you can see, him he's talking about this. He's, Abraham is the father of the circumcision, not only of those of the circumcision, but only also of those who walk in the steps of the belief which our father had in uncircumcision. So basically, it comes down to this: Abraham was uncircumcised first, and by his belief in God and his uncircumcision circumcision in the flesh he was declared right by god and then he was circumcised so we have this whole journey and this all speaks to that god has declaring right whether we are physically um following the law like from the get-go whether we are pagans whether we are we grew up with the law whether we are uh, maybe we are we, we were jewish in our in our lineage but then we gave, we lost our identity wherever we are whatever we identify as Abraham is our father, uh, if you will. He is our. He is the the one that we we inherit the promises that was made to him. So, Christina, I would like you to to just maybe I th I'd like us to start talking about the the different parties, the the different parties of this. Because what is Paul? Who is Paul talking about when he talks about the circumcision? You know, I think uh, we can talk about that. 
and uh, just to understand more like where is he what does he really mean by it because i think it's so essential for us to understand it to understand what he's really trying to say so in regards to this when paul is writing this letter to the romans he is like we mentioned in our previous video he is addressing a few different people a few different groups of people he is addressing those who came out of paganism who are gentile believers and who have never you know kept torah they didn't grow up keeping torah so he's addressing that group of people, but he's also addressing Jewish believers in Yeshua, those who, who grew up in Judaism, you know, without Yeshua. And in that, something that's very interesting and very important to understand is that within Judaism, there were certain teachers in Judaism that held the guidelines for how you are to keep the commandments, how you are to walk according to Torah. And these groups in Judaism are the schools of, are two different schools of thought. These primary groups are in the Pharisees, the school of Shammai, or the house of Shammai, and the house of Hillel. And it's really important whenever we read scripture to understand, first of all, who is the writer? What, who does he say he is? We understand who Paul is. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he learned under Gamaliel, which interestingly enough, even with what I just said a second ago, the two schools of thought, the house of Shammai, which is a group in the Pharisees, um, two groups in, under the Pharisee umbrella, you could say the house of Shammai and their teachings, the house of Hillel and their teachings. Gamaliel, who taught Paul, or Rav Shaul, Rabbi Saul, Gamaliel was the grandson of Hillel. So in that vein, let's explore these two groups in, Pharis in the Pharisaic um, belief. Because when we go back to Yeshua, when he spoke to, Fer to certain Pharisees, like even P.D. mentioned a moment ago, to some he had very strong words of rebuke and correction. And to others he got along with pretty well, or he just simply answered their questions. He didn't rebuke them. He just answered the questions that they put forward to him. The reason why is because he's addressing different Pharisees, different groups and different people. So let's go back to even what we were talking about in Romans 4, the circumcision. In the house of Shammai, the, the teachings of Shammai, these houses, these schools of thought began a little bit before Yeshua was born. So they were very prominent during the time that he was walking around and doing his ministry here on earth. And so those who were Jewish would be under and would be um, learning from either of these two schools of thought and adhering to the commands and the teachings of either of these two teachers. Now, interestingly enough, these two teachers were and their schools of thought were at odds with each other. So in just simply relation to Romans 4, when it talks about the circumcision, it's also a code word for a conversion process that the house of Shammai and the Pharisees under that school of thought um, promoted. And in this conversion process, we go back to Acts 15, 1, where it says that certain men said, that you must be circumcised to be saved. And this was one thing that was required for those, if you wanted to come into, you could say the faith or to come in to be a part of Israel, first, you must be circumcised to be saved. That was code for the entire conversion process that they would require. And it was very strict. It was very difficult. It was a burden. It was not welcoming at all. And, and it was not in the Torah, right? That was not, it was not it, it's not like God never instituted it. It's totally like a man-made institution. Exactly, exactly. That was never required in Torah. The guidelines at the house of Shammai, these groups of Pharisees, they came up with, you could say, fences and additional things. You could say the oral Torah to um, have their own understanding of how to keep Torah so that you wouldn't accidentally break Torah. But in so doing, they added to Torah. And especially the house of Shammai in this instance in circumcision and how you can come into the kingdom, how you can come into being part of Israel. They made it very difficult. They made it very um, made it burdensome to come in. And so in Acts 15, those who required circumcision to be saved, a works-based salvation. Peter and James had to address this, that it is not through your works. It is not through that act of circumcision that you are saved. Because we go back to Abraham. It was by faith, Abraham. It was belief in God. Now, by faith, Abraham obeyed, but it was faith first. And that's why when Paul talks about receiving the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness, it is that circumcision of the heart that comes first. That is the when you enter into the race, right? When we accept Yeshua as our as our Messiah and our hearts are circumcised, they're torn, and we go before him in repentance. We're baptized in the water and the Holy Spirit. That is how we come into the kingdom. That's how we are grafted into Israel. But there were 
um, there were certain groups in Judaism who taught you must do certain things first. And so Paul, as he's writing this letter to the Romans, he is addressing a wide audience. And some of the members of this audience believe you must do certain things before you can enter in. And he has to bring light and clarity to that where there had been judgment for those who were doing it differently. Like House of Hillel, interestingly enough, I have not touched on them yet. They simply taught that anyone who is interested and wants to join Israel, whether it be Jew, whether it be anyone, Gentile, and coming into fuller understanding of Torah, for example, if you were a Jew who grew up in paganism, but your Jewish lineage, right? And you wanted to come into walking according to Torah to, to attend their yeshivas, right? All you simply needed to do was have a desire and you could come in and you'd be immersed in water. That would be, that was the Hillel's um, conversion process, you could say. And they accepted Gentiles as well, whereas the house of Shammai did not. They made it very difficult, rather. They um, made it very difficult for anyone who wanted to come in. And so Paul is addressing this issue in the book of Romans, this issue of circumcision and uncircumcision, that it always gets back to the heart. And it always gets back to faith, because that's what it is founded on. Not man-made traditions that were added to make keeping Torah difficult, to make keeping it burdensome. Right. And so one of the houses, um, Shemad, so they went and they they and in the book of acts we actually read them coming up and causing some you know stirring some stuff up and you know we see them like christina briefly mentioned we see them the the, uh, the apostles then coming to address this issue and acts 15 is often used to um say that we don't have to keep any of god's law or only a little bit of god's law um, but really, we're, I'd like us to read through Acts 15 for a sec here to, to, to understand what they were really trying to say, because we need to understand that they were addressing this, this weird mindset that was creepy, creeping and this, this idea of man that we, are, we need to convert by getting a, a circumcision in the flesh first. And that's, which was never like we said, God's teaching. And that's what they were addressing. So... Um, this was a salvational thing. They say that, hey, if you want to get saved, you need to be circumcised in your flesh. That's how you get saved. But it's never, ever been God's teaching. So, Christina, do you maybe want to read for us through Acts 15 and then we can go from there? Sure. So we have, And certain men came down from Yehuda and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the practice of Moshe, you are unable to be saved. Now, pause really quick there. That's not in Torah. That was an additional teaching that was taught by the house of Shammai and it was becoming very prominent. And so these people came down from Judah, from Yehuda, teaching the same thing. And they brought it to this council of Jerusalem. And so it will now be addressed, this issue. So when Shaul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they arranged for Shaul, Paul, and Barnabas and certain others of them to go up to Jerusalem to the emissaries and elders about this question. This question being again, unless you are circumcised, you are unable to be saved. And having arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the assembly and the emissaries and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. And some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the Torah of Moses. And the emissaries and elders came together to look into this matter. So we take a pause here again. There were believers who were, of course, still Pharisees. Like even Paul said, he was still a Pharisee of Pharisees. But there's two groups of Pharisees. Those who were in the house of Shammai and those who were in the house of Hillel. So, and when they had been much dispute, Kepha, or Peter, rose up and said to them, Men, brothers, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the good news and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the set-apart spirit as also to us, and made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by belief, by faith. This is, now that, yeah, yeah, this is this is interesting, hey, because I think when as Peter was saying this, you know, this this part of God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the set apart spirit. And he's in the next verse said, made no distinction between us and them cleansing their hearts by belief. I think as Peter was saying this, I think he was thinking back to the sheet and the, 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 the different kinds of uh, animals that fell down. And, you know, God saying, you know, um, 
to him, God, or when he said, God has shown me not to call any man unclean. So this whole idea of, you know, again, we have this Pharisee idea, which was a man-made uh, tradition that they were, the, the Jews weren't allowed to mix with the Gentiles in any way. And so, you know, God showed um, Peter this vision to make clear to him that you are allowed to go to Cornelius you can enter his home you can mix with them if you will because that's how we're going to get the message forth this this thing peter that you this idea that you had that you're not allowed to mix with them that's not from me that's not from god and so you know that's why i say we we're, we're not making distinction between us and them because god cleanses their hearts by belief okay exactly and like you know um, p just mentioned in relation to peter kind of relating back to even the vision that God gave him and sending him to Cornelius. So we talked about the uh, house of Shammai and Hillel. According to Shammai, and this was the most prominent group of Pharisees at this time, so their rulings were law. And if you were a good Jew, you would likely need to follow what they taught. Um, they said you could not at all go into the house of a Gentile. That was breaking the law. God's law, no. Their law, yes. You could not go into the house of a Gentile. You could not eat with them. And so God had to come down to Peter and say, hey, you know, you shall not make a distinction between what I have made holy. You are to go to that Gentile because it is through faith. It is through the heart. And in that same vein, Peter is saying the same thing here. Now then, why do you try God by putting a yoke on the neck of the taught ones, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What yoke? Exactly. What is this yoke? Go back to verse one in the very beginning. Unless you are circumcised, you are unable to be saved. Yeah, that's it's. The, you see, a lot of people think, oh, the yoke is the law of God. Oh, we are free from this yoke. Oh, it's so horrible. But he's not talking about the law of Father. He's talking about a man-made instruction that's not from God. That hey, you need to do this, get circumcised to get saved. So. Exactly. And that's what Yeshua was against his entire ministry. Man-made traditions that added or negated God's law. That I mean, we have back in Torah, you shall not add or take away from the Torah. And that's what these certain groups, especially the house of Shammai, were doing. They were adding to, by their own traditions, to the law of God and making it a burden and making it difficult. But they were not teaching directly from the Torah. They were teaching their own man-made additions and this is what peter this is what the jerusalem council is correcting in this um, these verses but through the favor of the master yeshua messiah we trust to be saved in the same way as they so yeah. it is through yeah that's interesting because he's saying hey um you know we are saved in the same way as they are in other words you know jew gentile we are all saved in the same way now i want to ask the same a question and you know a lot of people would say you know oh, the law of god is given for the jews and we not for the gentiles right that's kind of the idea that we have um but if the law of god has no application in saving either jew or gentile then why would God only give it to one and not the other? You know, um, the law of God is bringing about a knowledge of sin. It brings about the understanding of what not to do and how to live. It's the instructions and teachings of our father on how to live. And so it's not, you know, a lot of people I think think, oh, you know, the Jews do the law to be to be saved and, and that's why they need to do it and we don't need to. Well, some Jews may think that, um, but that's not what God teaches. And that's never what been the teaching. The teaching has always been that we're all saved by faith. And then we all need to demonstrate that faith through obedience to him and to walk as Yeshua walked, who walked in accordance to his father's instructions. He never sinned, which is 1 John 3 verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, he kept the law. Now he's saying, whoever abides in me ought to walk like me, and I kept the law is basically what it comes down to. So it's interesting, you know, he's saying, hey, um, we are all saved in the same manner. This was a dispute in, in Acts 15, and it's just a dispute today. But I'm telling you that there's no more dispute necessarily. necessary. We, um, we are all saved through faith, but then now we just walk in obedience to demonstrate it. Right. So continuing on and Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilements of idols, from whoring, 
fornication, from what is strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has in every city those proclaiming him is read in the congregations every Sabbath. Well, because... So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, yeah. so uh, Christina, are you telling me that all we ever have to do as, you know, if we're not simp like say Jewish, but then just these things? Is that like it? <laughs> is that it? Yeah. As, <laughs> as a Gentile believer, all you have to do is um, don't commit adultery, don't eat blood, don't know. Of course not. Because can I, wait, wait, wait. Can I murder at least? I mean, murder is not here, so can I do that? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. It wasn't written here. So maybe that's not required as a Gentile believer. I mean, that was these are the only four that are listed in this Jerusalem Council. Yeah, okay, but, no, guys, we're just having fun. Um, the, but no. Yeah, but, but that is unfortunately what has many people have. I've heard that said before. You know, we only have to do these few things listed in Acts 15. But we need to understand that, you know, if there is something that is going on here much much deeper the we we discussed last week about the law that's written on our heart the law is is god comes with his spirit and dwells us writes his law on our heart now it's interesting that you know if the law if the spirit indwells you um he does not come and lay a a burden on you he doesn't come and lay this huge thing on you that you need to do let me make an example you know if you're married or if you you know you are gonna now you let's say you or let's just say you just met someone right and and you just entered a relationship and you don't know this person you don't know what they like you don't know what they dislike you don't know any of that but now th that person is not going to expect of you from day one to know everything. They're not going to expect of you. To, they're going to know that, hey, you're going to make mistakes along the way. You're going to, as you learn what, how to treat them and how, or, you know, what they like or what they don't like, you know, you're going to develop and your relationship's going to mature. And in the same way, you know, our relationship with God is a relationship. It's that thing of, hey, Father is going to work with us. He's going to show us the big things. Hey, if you're a drug addict, you're addicted to alcohol or you know whatever the problem is, that's the thing the Spirit is going to convict you of. That's going to be the big thing that needs to be addressed. And so what he's going to convict me of on day one is maybe even different from what he convicts you of on day one. And not because I need to do something else in you because we're all going to be directed to things in Scripture by the Spirit. But he's going to fix us the things that needs to be fixed on our hearts first. And so that's what it means to be uh, the law written on your heart. That means you're, there's an inf inward transformation that happens and you start changing in more into his likeness, start understanding and learning more about him, start learning more what he likes, what he doesn't like, God likes and doesn't like. And so, you know, this, I want to submit that these things that's listed here, who is this? Who is This is Antioch, right? This is um, a specific people that he is reporting this to, that they are speaking of. This is not actually even from for all, because we read in, um, I'm just going to skip ahead for just one second, verse 22. Um, he says, Then it seemed good to the emissaries and the elders with all the assembly to send chosen men from among them to Antioch. So they went to that place, those people to give this message to a specific people that they had in mind as they were discussing this. And so that's why what they were saying, these specific people, few things you know they were talking about you know um the farmers of idols whoring what is strangled and by the way all of these things are directly in the torah you know i can give you a few scripture re references exodus 22 20 leviticus 17 7 deuteronomy 32 17 deuteronomy 32 21 and the list goes on there all of these things that have been listed here are directly taken by the apostles from the Torah because they are obedient to the Torah. They know it. And so they're taking those big things and they're saying, hey guys, these things are huge. These things you are struggling with. You are eating things that are wrong. You're eating things that have been strangled. Otherwise, that's eating meat that has blood in it. That's in Leviticus. It's a Torah instruction on dietary law on how to eat. And he's, they're telling them, hey guys, you're eating this. Don't do that. You know, um, idols, watch out for idols, etc. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is the big stuff. And But they're saying, hey, and they're, they're saying, okay, so you don't need to worry about these guys or telling you you need to get circumcised to get saved. But these other, these things, these are things are you guys really need to repent and turn from because you guys are doing this and this is actually in the Torah. This is actually what God has said to not do. 
Right. And also, as it says, for from ancient generations, Moses has in every city been proclaimed and read in the congregations every Sabbath. So this is what your starting point. These are the things you need to address first. And then you will learn the rest every Sabbath as you go to learn from the Torah. But it starts with, as Peter even said previously, and God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the set apart spirit. And through it is through faith in Yeshua Messiah that we are saved in the same way as they. Mm. And, you know, this, this brings about a, an interesting thing, you know, when, like Christina said in verse 21, about how for from in, ancient generations, Moses has and is being read in every city on this, um, every Sabbath, right? And it's interesting because this is, he's, they're talking to about something that was going on in the day. Because see, what we call church today looked quite different. Mainstream church today looked very different from what they had, the congregations that they had. Because if you went to a church in the first century, what you would find was the Torah being read. Moses being read there. This is why they're saying, hey, by the way, like they're giving all this, by the way, oh, Moses being read in, in, in the congregations every Sabbath because they're getting together every Sabbath in the congregations to listen to Moses. So they're basically saying, okay, guys, we're giving him this list, but they're going to go there and they're going to get the rest. They're going to go and every like we do the Torah portions, which is basically a, like two or three chapters of the Torah every week. That's what they were doing. And they, so the, these, these Gentiles are going to go into the, 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 the congregations and they're going to be hearing it slowly, step by step, slowly. And they're going to be like, oh, and the spirit in them is going to point them into the, the Torah and be like, oh, this thing you need to change. This thing you need to change next. And it's that maturity process in our relationship with God that then happens. And the apostles knew this. So that's why they they said that, what they did. That's exactly what happens. We have this idea oftentimes that those who came to faith in Yeshua, that all of a sudden they broke off from synagogues and they started home fellowships and they were completely divided from the synagogue as well. But something we have to remember is that the Torah, the Torah scrolls, not everyone had a copy of the Bible like we do today. The only way they could hear the Torah, the scripture, the Haftar, which is the, the prophets and the writings, was by going to synagogue. And so they would go every week and then they would also meet in their homes and fellowship and relate how everything points to Yeshua and discuss that and have fellowship with each other like we have written in Acts and in the other books of the New Testament. But they would go to the synagogue like we have here to hear the Torah, to hear Moses being taught and to learn how to walk in obedience through faith. Right. And it's 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 so cool because in, in Acts 15 verse 31, we read something interesting. He says, um, and having read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. So after um, they came to give this letter to Antioch, these people that the apostles wrote this to, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Why did they rejoice? They rejoiced because the burden was lifted. Not the burden of, or, or you don't even want to call it a burden, not God's law, but the, the burden that the Pharisees came to bring in verse 1 of Acts 15. You know, the thing about Acts 15 is, Keep going to verse one because that's what it's about. It's about those who came to teach you need to get circumcised to get saved. So that's the burden that was lifted. And when they heard that, they're like, "Oh my word! That means we don't need to get circumcised um, to get to be saved. We can. We don't have to worry about that. That's amazing. And that was giving them freedom because bondage comes from man-made teaching and traditions, um, and that enslaves us." And remembering that circumcision is also a code word for the entire conversion process that was required and that had been set up by certain rabbis, specifically, like I mentioned previously, the house of Shammai. And so it was very much of a burden as well. And so those who were believers who had come from this same house and this school of thought were bringing in their understanding in relation to what it meant to come into Israel. And that also included all these other guidelines that were man-made traditions, including you must do this to be saved, like circumcision and other things. And it made it to be a burden. It was not in God's law. And so everything was here, getting back to Torah, getting back to faith. Right, exactly. Cool. So um, going back to, to Romans 4, um, you know, we, we see then it goes on in verse 18. And, and, and he, he uh, Paul starts talking more about, the, or he continues to talk about Abraham's model of belief. And, and he says, 
Romans 4 verse 18, who against all expectation, talking about Abraham, did believe an expectation so that he should become father of many nations according to what was said, so shall your seed be. And not having grown weak in belief, he did not consider his own body already dead, being about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not hesitate about the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in belief giving esteem to God and being completely persuaded what he had promised he was able to do. Therefore, it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Now, I want to ask you a few questions. Will we believe against all expectation? You know, it, it says here in, in, in Romans 4.18, Abraham believed against all expectation. It says that... Um, you know, and we also need to ask the question, are we completely persuaded, like Abraham was, that God is able to bring about what he promised? Are we completely persuaded about the God's promise of salvation through Yeshua today for us? Because, see, I found that many times the small things we struggle to trust God with. But if we think about it, the big thing is, it's actually a really big thing to trust God with something like salvation. It's a, it's a big deal. Like, and you know, if I want to submit that many times, like people who, who rely on their own works, like the, like the, this sect of Pharisees we spoke about, they simply did not believe God. It simply came down to, they didn't believe it was too big for them. To believe it and similar today that it's sometimes too big for us to believe and then we need to try and work and we struggle and then it becomes a burden and a debt a debt to to try and work for that salvation you know it's it, it, there's a fine line it's this thing of like I, i'm so happy I, I believe i'm free like god saved me he he has favor for me and he declares me righteous by what he did for me and now because i understand that oh god i love you so much lord and this favor that you have for me now drives me and this kindness of god now brings me to repentance and it's not what i do for him it's not how much i study it's not how many people i pray for on the street it's not how whatever i do it's it's simply now being like, God, I want to, I just believe, I believe that you saved me. And now because of that, I'm going to do the things that you asked me to do, not for it, but because of it. So you see, it's that fine balance. We need to always test and see that we're not, we're not stepping over a line of unholiness and, and going and, and, and falling away from good fruit because we're so content in our Oh, we just saved by faith and believe like many of our denominations today, unfortunately. But but also they're not fall in the other camp where we're, we're, we're so we don't actually believe that he's saving us through faith. And then we're trying to compensate by our own works. And so this is really what Paul is trying to bring balance to with with all of this. And yeah, I'm going to ask there really quick. You know how Paul is bringing that focus back to faith. We're in Ephesians 2. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, not of works as any man should boast, right? We know this verse well. And of course, the continuing verse, for we are his workmanship created in Yeshua Messiah unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, Paul very much in this letter to the, um, to the Romans, he's kind of like an immigration lawyer. What he's doing is he's showing how to come into the kingdom. It is through faith. It is by grace we are saved through faith, not of our own works, but yet we are his workmanship created for good works, created for obedience because obedience is witness of our faith. And as even Ephesians continues on, that therefore remember once that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called to uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Messiah, you were excluded from the citizenship of Israel you were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. So you who were once not citizens, by the blood of Yeshua, through faith, you are now brought in through his blood. For he is our peace, who has made both one and having, broke, and having broken down 
the partition of the barrier, having abolished in his flesh the ordinances. And these ordinances were the ones that had created this division like we talked about before. Jews and Gentiles were to be separate. Peter could not go into the house of a Gentile. These man-made additions that separated the Gentile from coming into Israel. Yeshua broke that down saying, you are welcome to come in through faith. Just like it's the same for Jew and for Gentile. It is the same exact thing. You are to come in through faith. And so to completely restore to favor both of them unto God in one body, one man, to the stake having destroyed the enmity by it. And having come, he brought as good news, peace to you who were far off. And peace to those near. Right. And so that course right back into Romans four. Go ahead. <laughs> right, exactly. That's that's amazing. It's so beautiful. So then he 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 goes and he says, it's interesting in Romans. I'm just going to skip ahead to Romans five verse twenty here, and he, and he says that um, the Torah came in beside, so that the trespass would increase. Now, listen, guys. This is a very controversial, if you will, verse. Uh, that's why I wanted to really talk about it. The Torah came in beside so the trespass would increase, okay? But where sin increased, favor increased still more. So it's quite a weird way of phrasing things. It seems like Paul is saying that Torah increases trespasses. Like, because he's saying, hey, the Torah came in so the trespass would increase. So I guess that's a good thing that we should just get rid of the Torah because if we get rid of the Torah, the trespass is going to go away. And then that means, hey, we can just you know just be and but that doesn't obviously that's not going to make any sense because you see the torah the, or, or a written code was given for us to show us that that to show us what where we fall short show us what sin is gives us the knowledge of sin see if if you don't have the knowledge of sin you don't know what right and wrong is it is hard to understand the favor of God. It's hard to understand the grace of God. To, if you think you're pretty good, if you think that you don't have anything wrong for you, and you don't really need a savior, right? That's what the natural thing is. And that's what many people believe. Those who believe that they've got good works and they're fine. Oh, I'm a pretty good person. You know, that kind of idea. <clears throat> they don't believe that they need a savior. And that's why he's saying, hey, it's actually a good thing because he says now the Torah came and so trespass would increase. In other words, it's we've been trespassing from the garden. Like it's not like we've stopped or didn't trespass. We trespass there, but the the trespass increases in that we now have the knowledge of our trespass. We have the understanding of our trespass. We re can recognize our trespass. And then it says, but where sin increased, favor increased or more so where we where sin increased where our trespass increased where we could now see and recognize our sin it says then favor increased or more in other words now even more god came and he sent his son for us to to die and that's that favor that increased and that just just that thing of god's basically giving us the torah to show us hey this is my law this is my instruction this is my teaching and this is how you fall in short and this is how I come to save you. This is the favor I'm giving you. So that's basically a God's, now we can actually recognize this favor for what it is. And so it's not to say, hey, the Torah is actually the thing that makes us bad people. No, the Torah simply makes us aware of it. The Torah shows us where we have fallen short. For sin is the transgression of the law, as 1 John 3 verse 4 says. And then in Romans 6, verse 1, he said, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin to let favor increase? Now, this is exactly what I've been saying. Shall we continue now? Since we have this favor, since we have this, shall we now just get rid of this Torah thing? Shall we get rid of this thing, this law? Because remember that sin is, means lawlessness. That's what the word sin means. So he's actually saying, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in lawlessness? To let favor increase? No. He's not saying. He's saying, no, I'm not saying go and throw the law away. He, this is what he says. Let it not be. How, they, how shall we who die to sin still live in it? How shall we who die to lawlessness, being without law, still continue being without law? Or do you not know that as many of us as were immersed into Messiah Yeshua were immersed into his death we were therefore buried with him through immersion or baptism into death 
that as Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. In other words, we're gonna we're gonna walk as He walked, not in how and death not in our trespass of the law we're not gonna because we were immersed we died with him we were raised with him unto new life now we're gonna walk as he walked we're gonna now walk not in death but in life what is life what does walking in life mean it means to walk in obedience to his instruction to his law because his law if we walk in obedience to that that's what good is paul says oh, his instructions his law is holy and righteous and good good is what he calls it it gives life because if if you break the law of god it it's it brings death it's like if you the law is like a um a, a fence if you will it's kind of like it keeps you like if you if you drive on a road it's what keeps you on the road it's like the lines it keeps you on the road and if and, and it, it tries to and it brings life if you if the if the lines disappear and it's dark and you don't see where you're going anymore you can get off the road and you can you can die, but the, 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 the Torah is there to keep you on, to give you direction, to how, show you how to walk as Yeshua. And Yeshua is then the, the, the walking law, if you will, the walking instruction, uh, the, the demonstration of what it looks like. It's like a car driving right before you to demonstrate what it looks like to stay on the road. And so now because we have the car in front of us, will we now get rid of everything else that directs us and keeps us on the path? No, no, no. Of course not. That's what Paul's saying. No, we're not getting rid of all of those things. Those things are there to protect us, give us life. And um, yeah. And then I'm going to go to verse 14. For sin shall not rule over you, for you are not under the law, but under favor. Oh, this is a good one. This is this is a very controversial verse. Um, what does he mean by saying that we're not under law but under favor? Does that mean, oh, you know, guys, we, we often use this verse and we we throw it out there and we without any of the context that we've thus far been giving it, and we try and say that we are not under the law, we can throw away that law, that bad thing that God gave us apparently, but it's bad. No, that's not, that's not what this is about. He's saying, this is what he means. Let me ask you the question. <clears throat> if you, um, if you, let's say you're driving, right? And you're, you're coming to a stop street and you stop at that stop street. You're obedient to the law of the road. Are you held under the law? Or are you rather held under the law when you go and you drive and you break the law of the road? You drive over that stop street. You're found and you appear before a judge. And now that judge is judging you he's over you and he's now you're held under the law you're held under that consequence that the law brings us so he's really saying that you're not under the law anymore you're under favor you're not under the now he's saying what is actually happening is you have this hey this guy who comes and he says hey you know what you broke the law you know what you are guilty you you there is a consequence for what you did that consequence is actually eternal separation from God. But you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to put my life on the line. I'm going to put my life there instead. And I'm not going to let you take the consequence. I'm going to take it upon myself. That's exactly what Yeshua did. And so he, that's favor, right? That's what it is. That's grace. That's mercy. So instead of us bring, be having the consequence of the law upon us, it's, we're not under it anymore. Now we, now it is on. Now Yeshua took it upon Himself. You know, guys, remember when the thief was on the cross, hanging alongside Yeshua, and 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 you know the thief is like, "I am a sinner. I am. I deserve to be here." As he tells the other thief, he says, "Who are you to to say? You know, I, we deserve to be here." And you see, that is that is what it is. And then Yeshua said. Oh, I tell you that you will be with me in paradise because Yeshua took upon himself the consequence of that man's sin, that consequence that would have taken him eternally away from God. In that moment, Yeshua, hanging beside him on the cross, took that sin upon him so that this thief, this man who broke the law, can come into the Father's presence and into paradise along with him. We're really talking about an, an identity thing here. We're talking about an understanding. 
This is really what this all comes down to what Paul is speaking of. It is this identity as a son that we have as favor. And we are to live in that identity that we're no longer a sinner. We're no longer a, a like that thief on the cross. But now we are we understand that we have favor. If we do that, we are then able to actually be obedient to what he said in the first place. You see, if we constantly live in this uh, under the law, if you will, it is really hard because now you're basically living without Messiah. That's what it means to live under the law. Those who lived under the law are those who denied Messiah, those who did not take believe in him who did not put their faith in him those are the ones who are under the law it is not possible to believe in messiah what he did for you and be under the law because it's a it's a it's a contradiction so because to be under the law means to be in direct transgression of the law to be under its consequences and punishments and cursings because you're walking in direct rebellion and disobedience to the torah to the word of god right exactly right so then you see and that this this all comes down to like the that you know, if we understand, hey, um, I'm not under the law, like Christina said, I'm not under that consequence. I'm a son. And that means, and that's what changes us. You know, we read in the scripture that it is the kindness of the Father, the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. Now, that is that is it. It's this favor. We see this favor. We see what we've done. We've transgressed the law. We deserve death, but we see this favor. And now this favor is kindness of God. And this kindness of God brings us to repentance and makes us want to be like him and, and be obedient um, to everything that he said and the, to this law that's now on our heart. So, Christina, do you maybe want to read from uh, Romans 6 verse 15 for us? So Romans 6, verse 15, what then shall we sin? Shall we transgress the law? Because we are not under the law, but under favor, under grace. Let it not be. So like in the example PD gave, if you're in the court and the judge is over, you're under the law, you're under the punishment of the law because you broke it. And then a man came in saying, he will take the punishment upon himself and grant you favor. Do you go right back out? and speed and break the law again because after all you got grace no let it not be do you not know that to whom you present yourself servants for obedience you are servants of the one whom you obey whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness but thanks to god that you were servants of sin yet you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were entrusted and having been set free from sin from transgression of the law you have become servants of righteousness because so, through Yeshua, sorry, through the favor he has given us, the spirit within us, we do not, we're not under the punishment. We're not under the law in that form. We're not under its consequences because we're not walking in open rebellion and open disobedience to the law. Rather, we're walking through the strength and empowerment of the spirit thanks to the favor and the grace through Yeshua that he has given us that we can walk now in obedience and become servants of righteousness. Right. He says actually obedience to righteousness there in verse 16. So it's, and like we've said, it's not that our obedience is what saves us, but our obedience is a big part of it. And it's, he actually says, um, of obedience to righteousness. And it, and, it, and he goes on and he talks about that obedience in, in the next verse. And he says to the form, and he says, it's the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Okay. Now, guys, we need to remember that that form of teaching that that they were entrusted to was the Torah. You know, the 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 Jews, if you will, they were entrusted with the words of God, and that is the preservation of the Torah that we have even today. None of us would be knowing the Bible, have the Bible, um, if it wasn't for them. And that's the word that they're. He's saying that they were entrusted to, and that's the word that we must be obedient and demonstrate obedience to, and not have like Christina said, a rebellion against. And having been set free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. I speak as a man because of the weakness of your flesh. For even as you did present your members as servants of uncleanness and of lawlessness, resulting in lawlessness, so now present your members as servants of righteousness, resulting in holiness and set apartness. For when you were a servant of sin, you were free from righteousness you were under sin you were in transgression what what fruit therefore were you having then over which you are now ashamed for the end thereof is death 
Because when you walk in sin, the fruit that you produce is death, and the result is death, and it brings shame. But now, having been set free from sin, having become servants of God, you have your fruit resulting in set-apartness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the favorable gift of God is everlasting life through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Uh, that's like the most amazing piece, one of my favorite pieces of scripture. You know, like that last verse, you know, the wages of sin is death, favor, but the favorable gift of God is everlasting life and Messiah Yeshua, our master. And so, you know, the wages of sin, we, have, we, we sit with this problem that we sin. It's the biggest problem that we have. It's why we, we are in the situation we found ourselves in. But God came and he came to lay his life down for us. We are that thief on the cross. We are that, that man next to him. We deserve to die. We, are, we deserve to die in our sin, to be completely far away from God and never be able to even come into his presence or see his face or you have any kind of relationship with him. That is what we deserve. But Yeshua, he, well, God, he came in the flesh and he came and got on the cross right next to us. And he looked up over to us and he said, this, all of this, I'm taking it upon myself. I'm going to be the one that carries this. I am going to enable you to come into my presence. And I'm going to go through and take upon myself everything that you deserve. And so that's what God came to do for us. That is the gift and brothers and sisters, like we, it's easy. Sometimes I think we oftentimes we use the word salvation so lightly, but it is the, the most incredible thing that God has ever done for us. And we must praise him every day for it. And so that means that now, like in verse um, uh, 21, um, what fruit therefore were you having then over which you are now shamed? For the end thereof is, is death. So now he's saying, hey, guys, now it's time to have a good fruit. Now it's time to live in verse 22, set apartness. That means holiness. That means um, 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 set apartness. That's, 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 that's being different. That's looking different from the world. That means looking different from everyone around you. It means a life that is difficult. It means a life that, 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 that's going to make you lose friends. It means a life that is going to look like Yeshua. And even, brothers and sisters, we've come to an age today where even those who consider themselves believers and maybe it's family, maybe it's friends, we, we have come to an age so lawless, so far away from the Father's word that even they, them who, who sometimes proclaim a belief in Messiah, even them would look weird to lead to us. Even them would look weird to, to a set of partners if we grab a set of partners. And they would say, why are you doing these things? Why are you... But the simple answer is just, we just want to walk. Me and Christina today, we're talking about, we just want to walk like Messiah. We just want to do what Jesus did. What did he do? How did he walk? Because we are sick of making excuses of, of, of this or that. We just want to be like him because we love him. And God wants that from us all. He wants us to be equally yoked and be like him. That is the purpose of messiah that's one of the purposes is to come and walk to, and, and and make us see how he walked and then do what he did to see that it is possible to do that and and god calls us to that and he gives us a spirit he gives us everything we need to do it he gives us a love for his word and he changes our hearts the only thing we need to watch out for is not to get sidetracked by traditions of men like that like we read in acts 15 like the apostles warned these people is don't get sidetracked don't don't worry about these men who come and impose these traditions and lies to you who tries to change the word the torah the the law of our god the instructions of god don't listen to them just go and listen go to the congregation where the law of moses was being read that's what they said guys do these few things that are big issues in your lives but then go and listen to the word of god that's where you're going to get it no and yeshua himself said you know these he told his very disciples he said those with him you know these these pharisees go go and listen 
to what they say. When they go and they sit on the seat of Moses, go and listen to what they say, but don't do what they do. Because when they're on that seat, Yeshua knew that they're not allowed to say anything else. That was the, the custom of the day. When they're on that seat of Moses in town, they're not allowed to read anything else except straight from Scripture. And so Yeshua said, go and listen to that. That's what you need to go and do. Listen to it. And, but don't do what they do. Don't, don't, because they're hypocrites is what he said. And in the same way in Acts 15, they're not saying anything else. They're saying, go and listen to the Father's word. God, guys, when we say the law of Moses, it's not Moses' law. It's God's law. Moses was simply the one that he was given. It was given to, to deliver to us. So it's part of God. It is who God is. He gave it. It is His commandments. It's His instructions. And He, it is His, um, it is His, it's, it's part of our vows with Him. You know, at Mount Sinai, we said, we will do these things. We will. And there was both stranger, there was um, both the stranger and the native born Israelite there. In other words, there was both Gentiles and Jews. Not even that as if the term Jew even existed, but that's a whole other story. It's, it's the 12 tribes of Israel. All of them were there, as well as all those guys from Egypt who were like pagans. They came and God gave all of them the same word. One law for the stranger and the native born. One word. Not he's, he's not saying, oh, I'm giving the law to the Jews and to the Gentiles. I'm not giving anything. He, I'm giving one thing to all of you because it's not the thing that's going to save you. The law is not what saves you. You're all Jew, Gentile, no matter what you are, you are, you are justified by your belief. But now, what? because I did this for you, come and be obedient to what I gave you. All right, guys, so may God bless you and keep you. I hope this video encouraged you. Um, we're going to, as, as I've said before, this is a series. We're going through the book of Romans. And today we went through Romans 4 to 6, chapter 4 to 6. And um, yeah, I hope this encouraged you. And I hope it is my prayer in this series. Our prayer is that it opens your eyes to the Father's and word and, and what Paul is really trying to say and to really understand what he's, he's saying. So, don't just take our word for it. Go on your knees, close the door in, in, on your face and ask the Father, what is truth? Ask Him because He will give you truth. That's what I did like a, lot, a few years ago. I said, Father, what is the truth? Because if I'm going to follow you, I need to know the truth. And if we do that, He will. If a humble heart, toss away whatever men say and just go with that, He will open our eyes to His truth. All right, guys, may God bless you and keep you, shine His face upon you, lift up His countenance upon you, give you shalom and grace and mercy. And uh, we will see you guys in the next video. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs>